So welcome everyone to uh, day three of the EIAC Change for Good uh, conference, Building an Equitable PR Industry. We have a, we've had a wonderful couple of days and uh, today I'm really grateful to Mark Webb who leads on the disability work stream for uh, actually supporting and leading on this work stream. And we really struggled at the start to get people on board to support us. Uh, so it was fantastic that, you know, Disability at the Table podcast, uh, which is hosted by Mark, was the first of the newly branded EIAC initiatives to get off the ground. Uh, and if you consider that, you know, 14.1 million people in the UK, and that's 19% of the working age population is disabled, um, disability continues to be an afterthought in our conversations. Our own in industry, we are guilty of that. And, you know, we have just 4% of practitioners, and I'm sure there are thousands and thousands of other people who are not, who do not want to speak or come forward uh, and identify as, as having any visible or invisible disability. Um, so one thing, we are not representative. And the second thing, there is too much of stigma attached to this whole thing. Um, so our keynote speaker for today is Mark Webb. And uh, Mark is a disability advo advocate and a public speaker, as well as head of comms for Shift MS, a social network for people diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Scler scler sorry. He plays uh, wheelchair rugby for Bournemouth uh, Alliance and Mark's international career, notably with Disney, David Lloyd, um, Leisure's Dixons has taken him through all favors of PR and comms role. And it was during his time with Dixon's retail, now Dixon's car phone, that he was diagnosed with MS. Um, and Mark blogs at uh, one man and his catheter.com. You can uh, go and visit the site there and is also writing a book apparently very slowly. Um, so welcome Mark. Uh, and I'll hand over to the stage, but just before I do that, just a few housekeeping um, rules. Uh, so please keep everyone is on mute, which is brilliant. If you can keep the videos on, that'll be great. Uh, please feel free to share your thoughts and experiences in the chat and also to drop any questions. At the end of Mark's keynote speech, we will have open up for questions and also during the panel discussion. Please be respectful of everyone's views and everyone's experiences and feel so that this is a safe space uh, for everyone and there is no fire drill and there's live captioning during the conference. Um, so let's get started with it. Mark, would you like to go? Mark, you're on mute. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. Okay, that's technology. No, we can't hear you. Is we could hear you at the start. No. The left mute. Did you? Uh, did you? Did you attach your uh, mic? Uh, do you want to call in your tech support? <laughs> yes, I think. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Decently? Absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'll blame disability. <laughs> um, so um, thank you very much for joining. Um, uh, I, I couldn't hear you, Suda, um, blooming Techno technology, but I could read you. So just to be clear, my um, my blog is one man and his catheters.com. I'm not sure what it what it read as. Um, as I'm um, uh, delivering this first part of the um, session, um, yes, I'll be talking about disability. Um, but the key point I really wanted you to think about while I'm talking is um, that angle that is a, kind of a buzzword, but could be so much stronger um, if we were treated as an equal part of society. Um, the buzzword employee advocacy. 
um, because I'm going to tell a story all about me, 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 me. Um, but um, with the, the the thinking behind it is because I've been well treated by um, employers um, through uh, my uh, senior career. I'm now in that sort of multiple doing bits and bobs phase. Um, I'm this huge employee advocate for um, my um, former employees and em employers. Uh, and it's so much more powerful than um, a certain online electrical, um, sorry, deliverer of goods that we've all depended on over the last 18 months, uh, beginning with A. Um, now, I, I believe they paid some of their warehouse employees to say nice things about them. Um, now, I can't say too much bad about them because they've also paid me to speak. But I just think that's absolutely the wrong way to go about employee advocacy. And when you think about uh, somewhere where I've never shopped called boohoo.com. Now, um, I I'm sure they sell wonderful clothes to more fashionable people than myself, myself but um, they've gone ar uh, around um, awful um, employee practices or supply chain practices. And I'm getting the sense that in the future gener generation of upcoming employees and consumers, where once upon a time, the only thing that seemed to start to matter to people was um, if a company was be starting to be green and now sustainable or not. I think people, employees, and I hope consumers are starting to look at companies who are have high ethical standards. Um, and that's not just to do with disability. I think it's to do with all um, employee and consumer treatment. Um, it's just doing the right thing. Um, and I, I just want you to bear that mind as I tell um, my little story about how, how life evolved for me. Um, as Suda, you mentioned 19% of the population, the working population are disabled. I always, um, as keep in my head 20%, but I, I think that's by the by, but one in five, and the ma vast majority of people who are disabled are not born disabled. Plenty are, but the majority aren't. Um, and in my condition, multiple sclerosis, it's typically di diagnosed between 20 and 40, the age is 20 and 40. So the absolute average working age in your prime, ambitious, looking to rule the world, and suddenly you, you're chopped down by this horrible, horrible diagnosis. And I've mentioned employee advocacy there. Um, bear in mind that when you talk about the global population of the disabled, of disabled people and the disabled community, our spending power is something along the lines of $7 trillion. So if you're not taking um, the disabled community into uh, in mind um, as consumers or potential employees, you're missing a trick. Um, that doesn't mean you have to suddenly uh, roll out the red carpet for us. We're, no, we're not after pity, generally. Um, we are after equality, after equity, after just being part of the conversation. Um, and, and we have a big voice. Uh, and I'm afraid um, I, I'm your typical cliche disabled person in that I'm in a wheelchair. Uh, I'm um, not afraid to use that to gain um, support and empathy and um, to um, shout a bit, little bit of, do you know who I am to get my way? I don't tend to chain myself to eight posts about stuff, but I know the power of somebody grumpy in a wheelchair and, and I'm not afraid to use it. Um, so um, I, I mentioned I've got multiple sclerosis. It's a very complex disease. It's called the, the snowflake disease in that every single one of us with the amount of symptoms that we can essentially choose from, so to speak, um, not one of us um, among the 130,000 or so in the UK have, have it of exactly the same symptoms or speed of progression or um, uh, levels of disabilities or visible or invisible symptoms. It's, 
it's a we we understand each other to an extent but we can't we can't share the ex exact um, exact same things so um just quickly talk through my career i know we're relatively time limited um 1992 high flyer beforehand head boy captain of rugby one of those annoying gits um and i uh, the result of being that kind of high flying bloke is that i didn't really know uh, what i intended to do with life and having been a ski rep which involved not a lot of skiing and a lot of chasing girls and chasing beer and the odd bit of skiing with a hangover um i, I rocked up at a place called disneyland paris or euro disney as it was called then, um, when it opened in 1992, with a fantastic job, part, partly because I'd been a holiday rep, um, except I was a holiday rep for celebrities. So I was looking after um, uh, Michael Jackson, you might have heard of him, uh, Clint Eastwood, Kevin Costner, uh, Gloria Estefan, uh, George Bush Sr., President Mitterrand. Now, I was living the dream. Um, Michael Jackson, of course, has a little bit of scandal attached to him nowadays, but in 1992, it was only about um, plastic surgery. It was only about, did Bubbles the chimpanzee turn up? Was he um, in sleep? No, is the answer. Was he sleeping in an oxygen tank? No. Was he weird? Bloody hell, yes, absolutely he was. Um, but um, 1992, I'm just mentioning that because my very first symptoms popped up there. Um, I had uh, an extreme case of um, pins and needles, which I kind of called nails and needles uh, for about three days, um, just really debilitating. Um, they didn't go away for those three days. Didn't tell anyone I was in my mid twenties. Then I went away, then, then they went away. I kind of convinced myself um, I'd had a minor stroke. And of course, if you've had a minor stroke, you should bloody go to a doctor. But I was in my 20s, so I ignored it. Um, then I developed some bladder issues, um, urgency to wee, um, running off to the loo, or living in France, running behind a tree, because that's what you could do in the 90s. Um, but again, that went away a little bit. Um, I'm afraid then I developed um, erectile dysfunction, as in floppy willy, um, and um, had to deal with all that. Um, but I wasn't putting two and two together. Um, met my beautiful wife-to-be, also at Disney, um, and uh, we came back to the UK. I uh, tried some agency stuff, but found myself being very corporate at heart. So we ended up at David Lloyd Leisure, a premium health and fitness brand. And um, it was there when I started stumbling quite frequently on my left foot when I was doing all triathlons, because being a PR person, I was having to walk the talk, so to speak. So triathlons was, was a big deal that I was doing. And that really started to start me worrying. Still didn't go to a doctor carried on with life, life was good, and I joined um, Dixon's Retail, now Dixon's Carphone, in about 2005 or 2006. And it all started to come together, and 2007 hit, um, and I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis after long chats with um, Mrs. W. And um, I, I really want to touch on three um, touch points that really um, impacted uh, my life at that point or, or ongoing with Dixon's. The first one was diagnosis. Um, I was at the time, I had a, an invisible disability, the various bits and bobs going on, but none of it was um, visible. But I went away, MS is probably one of the worst uh, chronic illnesses out there. Not that it's a competition between disabled people, it never should be, but it's a pretty shitty disease. Um, and um, I went away to feel sorry for myself for a couple of weeks. By the time I came back, um, the team around me had educated themselves. Google existed already in 2007. They had done some work to understand what MS was, probably more than I had, to be frank. And they knew roughly what I was facing. They had researched how to talk to me. 
when to back away, when I might need some support, how they needed to adapt for me. And I just had a very supportive community around me. Um, there's a horrible uh, phrase, um, it's a legal phrase called reasonable adjustment, which you are required to make for um, the disabled community, people um, with uh, mobility issues, for example. So when you think about reasonable adjustment, you think automatically about ramps for wheelchairs, about lifts for wheelchairs, but it can be all sorts of things. It could be larger, better screens with certain lighting for people who um, have um, visual impairment. It could be a quieter area in the building for um, anybody with some kind of neurodivergency uh, in, in, up in their mind. Um, it could be uh, quiet areas would be handy for me because multitasking is very, I'm a bloke, I know, so I can make the multitasking joke. Um, but also, um, because um, MS um, really, it literally atrophies, shrinks the brain and my thinking power and my um, processing power is reduced. My short term memory is a mess. Um, and there's all sorts of um, really um, physical and mental struggles I go on with. So I could be moved to a quiet room. But moving on, they had initially, I didn't need anything, but that empathy, that understanding, was wonderful. Stagger forward a couple of years later, I was now walking drunk, then walking with a walking stick, then walking with a sexy rollator, and then came the final day when I came in in a wheelchair um, and I needed um, those re reasonable adjustments. But another symptom of multiple sclerosis, not for everyone with MS, but for many of us, was and is um, chronic fatigue um, and my brain processing issues. And I was called into a room and I kind of feared the worst. Um, I call it the, the guilty check um, moment. I thought that was what was coming. There, there, Mark, you've been fab. Off you go into the sunset, um, have a check for a little bit and um, um, haven't you been great? Now, that was, um, absolutely the opposite of what happened and um, I can't remember the exact words but roughly speaking they said Mark you've been brilliant um, but you're not coping or you're not going to cope very soon how can we work with you to create a role for you that will work for the business and for you to keep thriving um, I actually had to go home in tears um, because of that and by the time I got back in the next day, they also said, and by the way, we'd like you to work four days a week instead of five, but we'll keep paying you five. Um, I, it was just phenomenal. Um, now, um, social media was growing fast at the time. I had an active CEO, Sebastian James. He's now the CEO of Boots, um, who was into Twitter initially to talk to his colleagues and to hear from his colleagues because he hated going to stores and like having the queen like being the queen having the store smelling of fresh paint um, so he liked to hear from his his um, store uh, colleagues about what was really going on but um, the uh, media quickly discovered that there was a CEO actually being honest and authentic on Twitter I started working with him to grow his presence on Twitter. And in that time, he grew to be the most followed FTSE 100 um, CEO on Twitter. I developed a, a presence. I've only got, I, I've got 6,000 followers, which is, well, that's great. But most importantly, that's followed by the media. And I grew the Dixon's retail, then Dixon's car phone presence to be a, a, a channel on Twitter. Um, the value of that was then I could still talk to the same journalists I'd been drunk in London with. I wasn't always drinking. It sounds like I was drunk the whole way through my life, but um, I was drinking um, uh, in, in London with journalists, but no longer able to do that. I was talking to them on Twitter and on results days or crisis days, um, you had our CEO or me on the phone to blooming Mark Kleiman or whatever. But you also had channels through Twitter 
where we had the same messages going out in slightly different languages. Media loved it because they could, you know, they got the standard, um, uh, our, the, uh, the health and safety of us, our employees is of the utmost priority, blah, blah, blah. The standard statement that interviews with Seb on the radio uh, or wherever, and they had Twitter feeds to feed from. So they, they took their own um, nuggets from it. I'm surprised other companies haven't followed that example, but it was a wonderful era where I was still doing a useful job for the company. I was growing Seb's kudos as a, a CEO and as authentic CEO. There can't be many others who have put the word stonking into a results announcement, but he managed that. Um, and I was still going. The third touch point um, was when uh, 11 years into my time with Dixon's Carphone, so nine or 10 years into my um, uh, multiple sclerosis journey, so to speak, I, I, I really was with my chronic fatigue um, suffering quite, quite seriously. Um, and, and I was feeling not able to cope. I don't think I had once let the company net down, but there was going to come a time when I did. And I approached them and said, roughly speaking, look, I, I'm not coping. I need to go. I can't recall what um, my um, uh, notice period was, whether it was three months or six months at the time. But essentially, um, they sent me off with immense goodwill and a rather hefty um, paycheck, which they had no requirement to do whatsoever. I had asked to leave, it wasn't redundancy. And um, the result is that four years since I've left Dixon's, I am this ultimate employee advocate for them. Um, I have no affinity for them in terms of um, requirement to, I think they owe me a coffee. I have no requirement to talk them up anymore. Um, most of the people who were my senior bosses uh, have moved on. Um, um, it's quite an incestuous world, retail. And uh, so there's people at Boots, there's people at Marks and Spencers, um, there's people at Amazon, um, but I'm still talking them up. And that's four years on. Uh, and just to finish on Dixon's, um, it feels like LinkedIn is a place to write a eulogy whenever you leave now. Um, but I feel like I was a little bit groundbreaking at the time. But I wrote a eulogy to um, Dixon's car phone on departure. Um, and it ended, I, can remember, I can't remember the, all the words, but it took me all of five minutes to write. But it ended, be like Dixon's car phone. That went viral, um, over 800,000 hits. Um, and nearly all the job opportunities and speaking opportunities and representation opportunities came out of that LinkedIn profile. So I now work part-time for shift.ms, which is a charity that is a social network and a, um, uh, a filmmaker for the newly diagnosed with, it, with um, multiple, multiple sclerosis. That's when you need to get hold of us um, with MS. You need to get hold of treatment early, exercise plans early, healthy eating early, social um, mental health care early. And that's when the prognosis is best. Um, I get loads of speaking opportunities. All the retail journalists still follow me. It, it all fe feeds in and that's all come from authentic employee advocacy. And I'm so proud of the people. I sold bloody washing machines, maybe a couple of funky things, but I sold washing machines, nothing sexy about it. It was all about the human side of interaction and going beyond this, this word reasonable adjustment, which, which, can, which is a legal requirement, but is also um, uh, sounds like um, you have to do it. Um, there's, a, there's a moral obligation and an empathetic obligation to do just that bit more. And um, I just, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to my original point. We are talking about the future employees, your current employees, you, some of you in the audience may be diagnosed with something 
in the future. I don't want to scare you, but you may well be, um, particularly as um, we age. Um, and we are a consumer market that's massive and un under um, marketed to. There's much more marketing to vegans or uh, the e ethnic communities or so many other uh, minorities. And we're the biggest minority. Um, I'm wearing purple deliberately. It's the uh, it's the symbol of um, the disabled community. Um, I've had purple hair for my sins. Um, I wear silly clothes deliberately because I'm used to being stared at in a wheelchair. And my general point, um, I'm, I'm looking all grown up at the moment, a bit unshaven, wearing purple. But the point of my silly clothes is, uh, what are you staring at? Are you staring at some weird middle-aged bloke with silly hair? Fine. Are you staring at a bloke in a wheelchair? Sod off. Sod off. I'm a human being. I'm normal. I'm different as all you chaps are, uh, chaps and, and ladies are on, on the in the audience here. Um, I'm just disabled. I'm a human being and I deserve a, a, a place at the table. And on that point, a last plug for a, um, a series of um, uh, podcasts that we've just started with my PRCA hat on, Disability at the Table. We deserve a place at the top table. I'm sounding like a politician here, but we are normal and we add immense value. I know a smiley chap in a wheelchair um, adds immense value um, to a group around a table, um, at the coffee bar, in a pub, just by my presence and because I, I see life through a positive uh, sphere, um, prism, uh, I can go do good. I can inspire people, I can thought provoke people. Um, I'm not inspiring because I smile. Um, we're all allowed to smile, um, but I just want to make people think and realize that disability deserves no stigma. It's not to be feared, it's to be welcomed. So thank you very much. I've timed it bloody perfectly. Hurrah. Um, so Suda, do I want to hand back to you for a second? Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for that brilliant, inspiring uh, speech, conversation. And you didn't sound, sound like a politician at all. Uh, any questions? Uh, does anyone in the audience have any questions? Before we move on, I'll hand back to Mark and we'll move on to the panel discussion. Um, doesn't look like. I think people are still absorbing what they've heard from you. So let's, I think I'll hand back to you, Mark, and then you can introduce the panel and we can get started with the panel discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Ah, Shani has popped up. Hello, Shani. Hi. So on my screen, I can see Shani and um, Alex Cleland uh, waving there. Um, one of them is prettier than the other. Sorry, <laughs> Alex. Um, but um, the title of our short panel is The Value and Values of Diversity, really building up on, on what I've said. I, I, I've tried to sell, sorry, of disability. I've tried to sell disability as one, the biggest minority among all the um, diversity flavors. Um, personally, I'm passionate about all of them. Of course, I came to diversity uh, via um, my disability, um, then ended up uh, with, with coming from two angles, really. I met people like Shani um, through sitting on disability and diversity panels. Uh, my wife is seriously talented and beautiful and senior, and I've seen her bashing against, her head against plenty of glass ceilings sometimes smashing her way through and I, I come at it very much um, gender is another flavor of diversity that I, I'm passionate about arguing for. Um, I want my wife to get another pay rise basically. <laughs> um, but um, uh, Shani, um, if we could start with you and, and Alex, just introduce yourself. So Shani, 
we'll give you one minute to introduce yourself and then we'll hand over to Alex. Yeah, sure. So hi everyone, I'm Shani Danda. I uh, am a disability specialist and entrepreneur. So I work with businesses and brands to help them become more inclusive for their disabled customers and disabled people. Um, and you may or may not know that life costs a lot more when you live with a condition, on average 583 pounds a month in extra costs. So I'm trying to do something about that and I've launched a discount platform. So it's essentially like a student discount platform, but for disabled people. Um, and I'm trying to harness the, the power of brands and businesses to help change attitudes towards disability, because let's face it, governments and charities aren't gonna do it anytime soon. So that's a bit about me. And um, Alex, who, you are very handsome, Alex. I, I know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my name's Alex Cleland. I'm a director at a PR agency called Houston. Um, I've been with Houston a few years. I've got consultancy experience of about uh, seven years. And then I spent about 10 years in house at various financial services companies, in global banks. Uh, before that, I was a journalist. I have a number of invisible disabilities which have affected uh, my ability to perform my job in recent years and uh, have affected my life in, in a big way. And so what I'm trying to do now is raise awareness of invisible disabilities in the workplace, what we can do about them and how you can recognise and appreciate them. Thank you, Alex. And, and I think that's a fantastic point. Um, um, I get the sense. I, I know there was a there was a, um, a gender discussion. Sorry, a race ethnicity discussion yesterday in these um, short term panels, and, and and I almost get the sense that um, that phrase "bame" is kind of going out of fashion because we mm -hmm. just lump anybody who's not white, British, Anglo-Saxon into uh, you know they've got an issue over there, and, and disability just covers so many such a spectrum. I'm the cliche in one sense because I'm, I've got the wheelchair to, to, to prove that I'm disabled, but it can cover so many angles. Um, and then um, Alex has, um, I don't want to say the other end of the, the spectrum because it's, um, it, 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 it's so many different disabilities that I'm, I'm not more disabled or better disabled or any, anything like that, but I'm just differently disabled. And, and then Shani, um, I'm really pleased you didn't even mention what your disability was because you're a human being first. Um, but you are also, Shani, Shani um, very passionate about, and, and you are just such a guru in this area. Talk to me about a word I learned it went from you, I think it was, um, okay. in all things diversity. And I struggle with my MS to say the bloody word. Yeah, no worries. I'll say about it. <laughs> Intersectionality. I had to really concentrate there. Talk to me about, me about intersectionality. Yeah, sure. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just start by saying that I do have a very visible condition uh, and I have a short stature of three foot ten, which you probably can't tell because I'm sitting down. Um, but yeah, I was just born with a rare genetic condition and um, I essentially live in a world that isn't designed for me and I'm, I'm trying to make it more inclusive for all. Um, so yeah, intersectionality essentially me or essentially looks at how a person's characteristics, attrib attributes or um, features of all of them, of the whole person, intersect and overlapped in order to, um, well, which helps us understand the world in which they experience. So let me help to bring that to life. Um, so I am a South Asian woman and I also experience disability. So that's a lot of three very visible things about me that you, you will see when you meet me um, or uh, as we chat now on, on uh, Zoom. And that means I have a very different life experience from let's say a black woman who experiences disability or a white woman who experiences disability because you know the, the different communities that we belong to or the different attributes and characteristics that we have they're all very nuanced so you know when I wake up in the morning I don't think oh wow I'm South Asian I'm a woman I've got um I've got disabilities 
who does that, right? For me, that would be equivalent of like, oh, wow, I've got brown hair. It's just me and that's all I've ever known. But when we talk about diversity and inclusion, what happens is a lot of people are stuck at diversity where we break down individual characteristics but essentially, diversity is a measurement, it's a count, it's a count of how many of X, Y, Z you've got in an organisation, for example. And that's where organisations get stuck, because I don't just experience my world through the lens of being a woman, or just being South Asian, or just experiencing disability. It's all of that, all the time, every single day. So I guess the result of that was I could never go into a space and all of that being recognised. You know, disability faces an even further sense of stigma in South Asian communities. And the, re the one big reason I, I guess, became a disability activist was because the lack of representation of disabled people of colour, um, the the policies and the decisions being made just do not reflect diverse disabled people's experiences. And we're talking about decisions that are made in governments that will affect your care, your health provision, all things like that. But if it doesn't take into account your community, your background, your life experiences, the opportunities that you have, then it's kind of like you're always you're always playing catch up in a system that is never allowing you to thrive. So yeah, that's a really long uh, example, but essentially that's for intersectionality. And finally, we are all intersectional. Even if you're a white male, you're intersectional too. And you absolutely have so much to add to this diversity and inclusion conversation because I don't know what it's like to be a white male and we all need to learn off each other. So I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you, Shani. That was that was fantastic. I'm going to say it one last time to see if I can get it right again. Intersectionality. There you go. Ten points to me. Um, thanks, Shani. Um, and and we. I, I remember the first time I met you, Shani. Um, I'm appalled at it. Actually, I said, I, I said, "Yay, I'm taller than you," because I, we we are both used to um, we're both used to being butt height in, in life. And me in my chair, you just because of uh, the, the the way you've grown up. Um, so um, public transport, bloody horrible. <laughs> you you will complain about being at armpit height. We're, we're, we're butt height. Imagine that. Anyway, um, Alex, another intersectional, we, we're both white privileged males. Um, you don't have to disclose your disability. None of us have to disclose our disability, by the way, although it's pretty bloody obvious with Shani and I. Um, Alex, you, you don't have to disclose your disability. Um, talk to me about invisibility, invisible disabilities and, and where your, your view of the world comes from. Well, I'm very happy to talk about my disabilities, actually, because I think invisible disabilities, I've got multiple uh, invisible disabilities. I'm very fortunate in that respect. Um, so I have type 2 bipolar disorder, which is characterised by major depressive episodes mainly. Um, which can really affect my work and is a chronic disease as well. So the episodes get closer together um, over time. I also have uh, had Crohn's disease. So I had the lower half of my digestive system removed. So I have a pouch on the front of my body to collect waste. I can't absorb salts properly. I get very dehydrated and faint. And also I get leaks from this pouch, which mean cause me all kinds of problems in the office and elsewhere. Um, and I tend to faint if I have to stand up for too long. Um, I also have psoriatic arthritis, which is a form of inflammatory arthritis that people with inflammatory bowel disease get, um, which basically is inf inflammation of all the ligaments and tendons around the joints. So I have to take immunosuppressant medication for that and uh, painkillers. And with all of these conditions comes chronic fatigue, uh, which, as you've already mentioned, Mark, uh, can really affect your ability to work. So I have all of those disabilities. And yet, if you met me in the office, you might say, I get it off often, even when I'm feeling really bad, is, well, you look well, you look all right. Um, and that's really tough to hear, because on one hand, you're thinking, oh, well, it's great, I, I look all right. But on the other hand, it kind of makes you feel like people don't believe that you're ill. Um, even when I'm putting my name for a panel like this, I feel like, you know, some people might think I'm an imposter, because a lot of people who know me don't know 
about my invisible disabilities. So it's difficult having those and being recognized in a working environment for them because it's not so obvious. Um, and it's difficult to explain and make people understand. And I think particularly with mental health issues, there's growing awareness of mental health issues in the workplace, um, thank God. But at the same time, people don't really understand it. People don't understand bipolar disorder, people freak out about and either think you're like Stephen Fry, which I wish, or you know, <laughs> you're a complete maniac, um, which I'm not. So it's it's building awareness and understanding of that. And also like the subtleties of having you talk about catheters, I talk about my ileostomy pouch um, and all the kind of everyday problems and practicalities that can bring, bring like having to be near a toilet, um, having to have a change of clothes with you uh, at all times, having to have medical supplies, all these little things that um, you have to think about, as well as the vast quantity of medication I have to take on a daily basis. Golly. Um, just reminds me actually when you're talking that the a word chronic I didn't really understand until I was diagnosed with a chronic illness. Chronic I, I interpreted as as a um, when I was younger chronic felt like really bad. Chronic um, in in disability in illness terms means forever. So there's no cure um, for any of those things that Alex has described or or I described. So. Um, uh, and just Alex, I didn't know your bipolar side of your um, disabilities is progressive, but mine is progressive. But chronic means forever. And um, when we're talking about autoimmune diseases, which is one big flavor of um, disabilities, um, I don't think there's been a cure for one single one of them. Uh, diabetes type one is one example, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, multiple sclerosis would probably be the leaders, so to speak, among the 80 conditions. But anyway, that's by the by. Um, Shani, Shani, Shani. Um, uh, back to you being a guru, which is the most important thing about you. Um, now, we, we've touched, both, um, all three of us, on the language around disability, uh, which is very important. Alex, um, you look so well. Uh, we've all had that. Um, when we say uh, we're tired or dare to mention we we're tired, everybody, or at some point somebody will say, I'm tired too. And you just, you don't want to throttle them because you're allowed to be tired, but I'm afraid it's different. And it's so hard to portray that it's different. Mm -hmm. similar, with my, similar with my memory. Um, when I say I forget something, people say, me too. And again, I want to throttle them. And that's not fair of me because people are allowed to forget things. But it's different. Um, Shani, can you talk about the language we should and could uh, use around disabled people and the disabled community? Um, we haven't got time to cover every word because it's, <laughs> it's an evolving thing. But in general terms, language with us dudes yeah i think language is one of the biggest barriers actually to disabled people being included in society um there's some research by scope that says two-thirds of brits say they feel awkward around disabled people and we know it because people are afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or they're going to cause offense so actually they would just rather not have the conversation at all um but since disabled people make up about one in five of the british population that's a lot of time a lot of people are feeling uncomfortable and actually you know the provision of opportunity for disabled people shouldn't come down to you feeling awkward about language that you use essentially so um <laughs> And again, look, this, I'm talking about disability, but you could apply this to many other diversity strands. You know, um, language, it's, it's very important to keep up to date with appropriate, appropriate and acceptable language. And the meaning of words is constantly changing. And personally, with a topic like disability, it's such a misunderstood, um, characteristic you know if you think about it as as disabled people 
we learn about disability from non-disabled people. And then that means we have lots of internalized ableism. So ableism is, is essentially discrimination and social oppression of disabled people. And, um, you know, it, that even creeps into the language that we use. So what I would say as a, you know, a, a top line rule is, do not ever use language that portrays people as, you know, victims, pitiful, suffering from, because that might not be that person's experience. Like, yes, we all have bad days, but that doesn't mean we all write about each other in that way. You know, we are all individuals. We live very meaningful lives. And just like everybody else out there, we we deserve to have our ac accurate portrayal, especially in comms, like the amount of stories I've had of mine sensationalized, it really makes me not want to do things with press and unless I have the final say and I can make changes, but then I'm doing all the work. So it's like, is it worth my time or not? Um, another thing I also want to call out is this balance of person first language and identity first language. So um, person first language would say a person with disability and identity first would say disabled person. Again, there's not going to be a group of disabled people that agree on all of this because everybody is at a different experience on their own disability journey. If you met the 20 year old version of me, I wanted nothing to do with disability. Then I uh, learned about the social model of disability. We haven't got enough time to talk about that. Please go and Google it. It essentially means that you aren't disabled by your condition or your impairment. It means that you only experience disability from the barriers in the world and the bias that people have towards disabled people. So many disabled people actually prefer ident um, identity first language. So, you know, I don't call myself a person with South Asian-ness. And I don't call myself a person with Britishness. Therefore, I don't call myself a person with a disability because I, you know, I talked about the, these three lenses earlier. I can't ever take the disability lens off. It's so inherent. It's it's so part of me. It's my it's form it forms a big part of my identity. Um, and and by calling myself a disabled person, I'm emphasizing how people with conditions and impairments are disabled by barriers in society, not by the conditions or impairments that we have. So yeah, lots there to uh, absorb and digest, but if you go and look up the social model of disability, um, that will answer a lot of your questions. Brilliant. And, and yes, and, and I'd like to add, look, we can, it, it, it's so complex. Um, I mentioned 80 just autoimmune conditions, um, and there are so many different, there's no way I know how to refer to all those different disabilities and, and nuances around just those disabilities around which I, I know a bit more than other areas of disability. Um, so we do understand when you make mistakes in um, in approaching us in, in little faux pas. Um, that happens. It, it's more around that fear of approaching us in the first place, about that fear of just asking us and, and trying to work with us rather than um, hopping around us like we're, you know, we're, we're Voldemort or something. Um, it, you know, and, and it evolves. So um, when I grew up um, and um, I, I was watching A Christmas Carol, of course, we were cripples and we were infirm. Those were the words. And as a kid, um, I was saying spaz in the, cl in the classroom. I'm, I don't remember saying it, but everybody was calling each other spaz. And in Ultimate Karma, of course, I get spasms now. So serves me right. Um, then it moved on to handicap. Um, and actually, that's still um, the, the phrase in some, you know, in France, where I used to live and in America, handicapped is the acceptable word. The acceptable word in the UK is disabled now, but it does evolve. So no blame whatsoever attached to somebody who makes that little faux pas with the goodwill. 
with the willingness to approach us in the first place or Google it or just have that little 10 seconds of reflection before saying something arsey. Um, so, it, 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 you know, we're open. There is no perfect answer, but just do, do treat us with empathy and understanding and approachability. Don't skirt us round us like we've got some leprosy mm. disease that you're going to catch tomorrow. Um, so um, now, Shani, arch communicator, Alex, arch PR guru with many years of agency experience. I've, I have a horror of agency experience. I hated the pitch process because I always lost. Well, not always, but there were too many losses in my life to, to bear it. So I, I'm a corporate dude at heart. Alex, talk, talk to me about, um, well, you've got chronic fatigue. I didn't realize that. Um, how the bloody hell um, can you um, keep up life in an agency and what's the culture of agency like now um, as regards to you and how could it be better? Um, in terms of how I cope with it, I work four days a week. So then I gave myself three days to recover. Um, and I also have been working from home since, the, since COVID-19, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and that's going to continue. I had an occupational health assessment and said I should be home-based rather than office-based. Um, given all of my things, I actually kind of pressed for an occupational health report to have it all in black and white. So that helps because then I don't have the commute. So I don't have all the stress and tiredness of the commute. Um, I have flexibility around my hours to an extent because the fact is agency clients want you at their beck and call all the time. So it is difficult to have boundaries around that, particularly when you're a senior person. Um, but I'll give you an example. Yesterday, actually, I've had a bit of a flare up. So I'm having some fatigue issues at the moment. So I knocked off at four o'clock and went to bed um, and slept on my lunch hour. Those are things I wouldn't be able to do if I was in the office. Uh, so that makes a big difference. Uh, I, I think, you know, in terms of reasonable adjustments of work, there are opportunities when I'm having a depressive episode to maybe reduce my workload or my board responsibilities to an extent so that um, I can concentrate on getting the job, job done in a core way and being relieved of some of the duties um, in the short term. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, the flexibility around hours, the flexibility working from home. But at the same time, it's still very difficult because I have the CEO of a company um, wanting to speak to me on video at you know, 6.45 in the morning. And there's not a lot I can do about that. I just need to be ready to do it. Um, that doesn't happen every day, but it does happen frequently. So it's about being responsive around it, but then realizing that you can build some flexibility into your day by maybe working later or working when it suits me. I'm, I don't work Fridays, but then maybe if I have, you know, I'm having a big flare up and I think, okay, I'm not going to work Mondays, but I'll work Friday. It's that kind of thing. So it's building it in. So, I mean, I think flexibility is the big thing that you need in agencies to do that. Flexibility and respect. Um, respect, not just for your disabilities, but respect for one another and your working practices and boundaries around work-life balance, which is tough to get. But if you enforce it with your clients and um, they get to realise that you, you, you are actually enforcing these boundaries rather than just saying what they are and not just saying yes to everything, then that brings um, benefits. And we're seeing that increasingly in our clients in terms of how they manage their workloads and how they manage you know, the changing world of work so that they're putting practices in place to improve their work-life balance, which has a knock-on effect on us because we're not getting emails at 10 o'clock saying, can you have this on my desk tomorrow morning? Which, you know, can be one of those things that happens in agencies because people think of agencies as just, you're always there, you do what you're told and you get it done and you get it done when we want you to get it done. Um, you know, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, but that's increasingly changing, which does have an impact on agencies. You know, teamwork and collaboration as a core value is really important because you need to be able to rely on your colleagues in the same way that they can rely on you. Uh, openness, talking about issues. Well, I've worked with people who, you know, I've managed people who are suffering from mental health or, or addiction problems themselves. Uh, and actually being able to disclose that, then you can understand it. If somebody's suffering from depression at work and they're not looking particularly perky, then 
you know, if you know they're suffering from depression, you're less likely to go up to them and say, cheer up, why the long face? You know, which is something I've had is like, why don't you cheer up? What's wrong with you? Like, well, I kind of want to kill myself as, you know, <laughs> that's the kind of thing. So I think openness, the more we can talk about it, the more we can respect diversity and neurodiversity in particular, you know, and I put bipolar on that spectrum for it. You know, there's different working practices. It helps me if I'm working in a closed environment on my own because I get distracted easily and then I, I can focus. And when I'm being introverted or, you know, don't find social contact helpful, then being able to work in a separate room or work from home it is enormously helpful, it makes me productive. Whereas if I had to go into the office um, and I'm suffering from fatigue, then I'm not going to be productive in the workplace. If I'm suffering a depressive episode and I really can't cope with social contact, I'm not going to be productive in the workplace. Just having that flexibility that's being introduced by COVID and being able to have that conversation with the employers where previously, even at Houston where I work, we didn't really, um, we thought flexible working wouldn't really work for an agency. But obviously it has, you know, and all those prejudices are gone. So there is something about the changing world of work and how that evolves and what works for everybody. But I think in terms of culture and values, diversity, collaboration, flexibility, respect, and openness are the things which are core to helping people with disabilities succeed in an agency. I bet you, um, I bet you love Piers Morgan and the fact that whenever somebody appears under mental health strain, he sort of says, buck up or whatever he bloody says. Yeah, there's a few things I'd like to say to Piers Morgan as well. <laughs> um, okay, um, now we're in a funny phase. Um, there's a certain um, pandemic going on that we're all focused on. I'm bloody loving it because I'm talking from my kitchen um, and um, it, it's opened up more speaking opportunities to me, not less. So I'm loving it. Um, what I fear post pandemic is that we all, to an extent, rush back to what we saw as the old normal, um, what the disability community has been crying out for, out for which is flexible working practices, um, has been proved. Suddenly, we spent 20 years screaming for it, and um, uh, the world turned on a dime, and everybody could flexible work within, what, 28 days of the pandemic hitting, um, and there was proof that how many um, not every job, I get that, but how many um, jobs could be done flexibly or entirely home-based. I think a mix of, of both is probably ideal, but certainly it's possible to work from home. So um, Shani and Alex, I'm going to ask you both what you would like to see coming out of the pandemic. Like I say, I'm slightly, I'm slightly scared in the sense that it, it's been a wonderful learning curve for us and I, I fear we'll regress, but that, that I should be a bit more optimistic than that about things. Shani, what would you like to see coming out of the pandemic in, in reference to um, our community? I had a lot of optimism at the beginning of the pandemic um, that things for disabled people, especially work, would get a lot more barrier free but actually all we've seen is that disabled people's lives are just seen as expendable and collateral damage and now disabled people are even more disabled than before the pandemic and if anyone saw the updates yesterday from the government it's it told essentially vulnerable people to avoid indoors and unvaccinated people all summer how are you supposed to know who's vaccinated and unvaccinated in the supermarket, for example? Or, okay, you get it in your fam family and friends, you can ask them. But what we're seeing is when something suits the majority, it can happen overnight, i.e. remote working. There are disabled people that can and want to work that haven't been able to because of so many inflexible practices from employers. But as soon as everybody needed it, it happened overnight. And you know, that really annoyed a lot of disabled people. And now it's, yeah, it just seems like we're being continually overlooked and forgotten again. 
But I think what the government doesn't realise is, is that they're just allowing people to get COVID and then get long COVID and essentially end up with a lot more disabled people. So we've got to get used to sharing our blue badge base. Yeah, um, long COVID is a new disability. It is, it is. Welcome to our world. Um, Alex, come on, um, it could be a bit more positive than Blooming Shani there. Well, I'm going to be a bit more positive in some ways. I mean, as somebody who's immunosuppressed uh, after the government announcement yesterday, I thought, what am I supposed to do? You know, um, I, I'm, well, I'm going to go on a train into London and I don't know who's got it, who's not, um, you know, and then I'm going to end up in hospital. Great. Anyway, that's a negative thing. On a positive side of things, it's the virtual world of work, which is happening now and has happened over the past 12 months, the virtual meetings where you don't have to travel across London to get to them. Uh, and you can have an effective half hour catch up on Teams or Zoom or whatever. Um, and that's as effect is proven to be as effective as a face to face meeting, not to denigrate the importance of face to face meetings, because they're there are body clues and casual language you have, like casual conversations you have in and out of the room as you're talking. But it, I'm noticing that a lot of my clients are happy to continue with virtual meetings, which is a real godsend because it's just more effective. And I think that kind of hybrid model uh, of, in terms of working in an office and working from home, but a hybrid model in terms of how you work with others and how meetings happen uh, is actually going to happen as well because. For a CEO of a company, they're time poor. It's going to be interesting for them if they're, you know, they're traveling, they want to do a Teams meeting, they can schedule things a lot easier rather than having to be in an office for Monday 8.30 to meet me. So I think that's going to continue and I hope that will continue. Uh, I, I think that's the most important thing for me. There lots of things have been proven to work over the last year, uh, which people did work. Um, and I think that they will continue in the future and I think it will only be the most regressive employers who return to the world as it was before the pandemic yeah yeah I, yeah I hope we meet reach a happy medium um I'm going to re raise a couple of um, negatives just that have occurred to me but uh, try and end on on a positive I don't realize that uh, I don't know if many people realized um but um while we're all crying out for an opening up of the world, a return to some kind of normal, etc. Um, I don't want to put a down on it, but 60% roughly of those who have died, those are fatalities from COVID have been disabled, so from our community. So when, um, uh, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the, the stats came out, X number of cases, X number of um, deaths, and it, it didn't say, but don't worry, but essentially it said, but don't worry because X percent of those had underlying condi conditions. Now, I realize that was meant to reassure the public, but it scared the willies out of me, um, let me tell you. And I, I, you know, in my community, a lot of um, people on, uh, with MS are immunosuppressed or on immunosuppressant drugs. They were dying and I lost friends and, uh, and that, that was tough. And um, then you read about the people who desperately want to open up, open up and lick people or whatever they want to do. Um, and um, they talk about it, it's only the old and the dying. I've, I've seen that in writing who, who, who get COVID or die from COVID. Yeah, cheers buddies. Um, I, I'm, I'm a dad of two, um, I'm, I'm a loving husband, well, I hope I'm a loving husband. Um, I, I'm doing my best. I want to live. I want to live a normal life. I want the world to return to a version of normal. Um, but um, there's a few people who, who want to write us off and, and, and we're, we're not lesser beings. Thanks very much. Um, on the water cooler moments, Alex, that, 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 that essentially you were referring to and, and the main, you know, the, the face to face meetings. I just want to give a plug for shift.ms and what we did. It's not a replacement at all, but we've started up as a, a little, we're a small charity, but we've started up speed natters. We are assigned every, every week a 10 minute date, so to speak, with one of our colleagues where we're not really allowed to talk about work. We're just supposed to have a 10 minute chat. 
And I love that because that is the water cooler moment. Again, without the body language, again, it might lead to nothing like water cooler moments do, um, don't. Um, but um, at the same time, it is that sort of magical interaction of colleagues that's outside the, the, the official meeting point with the official agenda that just might lead to something new and innovative and creative and brilliant and cost saving and whatever. So speed natters, you can, you're not allowed to, I, I think we trademark the name, I'm not sure, but I think that's a lovely idea for groups to, to, to meet while we are isolating and, and being careful and um, not allowed to meet, not allowed to do X, Y, Z. So um, that was one. And then I had another point and I've got MS and I've forgotten what it was, yay. Um, so that's good, I've done that before many a time. So um, we are getting to, um, we've got a little bit of time for question. I think I've covered off the main points that I felt that we should cover off in this discussion. Um, the, the, the main points I want to leave it before coming into questions is that we are your employees, we are your potential employees, we are your consumers. And we're a big chunk of them and we're normal. Here endeth the lesson. And Suda, um, I, you, you probably have been better at monitoring stuff. Um, could, do you mind feeding some um, questions to us? Were there any? People may have zoned off now. Um, so thank you, Mark. I think uh, one of the questions uh, came just before, just when you finished your uh, keynote, and that was to do with your experiences um, how can we encourage workplaces that are less progressive to get there? How long have you got? Um, <laughs> Elevator pitch. What I fear in all flavors of, um, maybe um, Shani and Alex might like to come in after me, um, I don't feel obliged to, but what is most important to me uh, and I fear in all this diversity, diversity is the new green, isn't it? It's the new trendy thing. Um, and um, there's a lot of tick box going on here. There are a lot of people who empl employ um, um, a DNI person on 18 grand and great, we've done it. That's it solved. Um, so what I would like to see is um, a very senior sponsor preferably a CEO, if not somebody on the board who is passionate about um, diversity. I'm not talking about disability purely, but DNI is huge and it's an opportunity, um, you know, sustainability slash green will save the world. Um, but in terms of um, company culture, I think that's what the next generation are looking for. Like I said, when I was talking, I was selling blooming washing machines. I'd been running around a theme park, looking at fireworks, hanging around with celebrities, popping into a roller coaster for lunch, as you do. I had a wonderful time. I had an equally wonderful time with a company selling washing machines. Other white goods are available, but the company culture was so fun. It was up there with roller coasters. So company culture is incredibly important and I hope it's gonna grow in importance. And it's, so it's the buy-in at senior level that I believe would lead to that. I can't ask, you know, obviously, Alex, he, he, he's clearly grumpy, um, <laughs> shiny, um, whatever, you, you can't, um, you can't provide for everybody to skip into work, give everybody hugs and we all love each other. That's not gonna happen. What you need is buy-in at senior level would be my, my one thing. Personally, I'm not one for targets, but I am one for, and, I, and there'd be people who disagree with me on this, um, but I am one for transparency, for declaring the number, you know, your, your, your BAME, um, representation, the number of disability, uh, dis sorry, disabled people who you've employed and where you uh, expect to move, pay different pay uh, differences. I'd love those to be transparent. 
um, and that would help as well. Um, those would be my two things. So transparency, not targets, that's a personal view. Senior representation, I'm sure we all agree on that. Shani or Alex, I, I don't know if you want to wade in. Yeah, just to build on your point there, I think, you know, despite disability being the largest diversity strand, it's got the lowest priority on the overall inclusion agenda. So we want intersectional inclusion in everything, not just on disability, not just on sexuality, not just on race, because we are all intersectional. That's the one thing that I would say um, that's really going to move the dial here. And look, there is a business case, but it's also morally the right thing to do. If I'm a bit tired of people joining this conversation when either they know somebody who has a conditional impairment or I don't know, they've got some other experience of it because essentially, yes, it could be you, it could be your, you or I, but it's definitely gonna be your customers and it's more, li more than likely it's going to affect some of the colleagues that you also work with too. So don't just think this is a conversation you need to be part of only if it ever starts to affect you or someone you know. We need allies. Disabled people clearly aren't occupying the spaces that they need to. So we need the help of, of non-disabled people. And an example is Jo Wiley. She prioritised disabled people getting a vaccine. She is a non-disabled person. Despite millions of disabled persons asking for the same thing, it took a non-disabled person, a celebrity, a white woman, to make that happen. So there we go. Yes, um, Jo Wiley has a um, severely disabled sibling, does she not? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah, kudos for, to Jo Wiley. Kudos to allies, um, because 80% um, of the pip, um, population are not disabled, but um, we could all get engaged. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm fortunate in being in the senior position in an agency because I've encouraged people to have mental health awareness training, uh, particularly at management level. And then there's something else I discovered recently called the Mindful Business Charter. I don't know if you've heard of it. It basically started out in professional services firms, in law firms, to encourage people to treat each other with more respect, put more boundaries around work and to improve mental health and reduce burnout. Uh, and it's something which is spreading and we've become signatories to that. And I think the more that organisations can club together and champion um, issues around disability, the better. So it doesn't need to be you on your own, your company on your own. There are others out there doing the same thing. And, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the more that can be done, the better, I think. Uh, so that's how organisations will change. And we're talking about investment banking and, and law firms. And if it can change there, it can change anywhere. Yeah, I, I, um, Alex, you, 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 um, you've talked very powerfully about um, mental health there. And I feel, it, look, it, it's, it's over a hundred years since a lady ran in front of a horse to, to move the, the suffragette and, and the gender movement forward. And, and we're still not there, are we? Um, and, and so it's going to take an awful long time for, for, for all the other diversity cases to, to move forward. Uh, and, and I feel personally from an outsider looking in um, MS, 50% um, of people with MS will be diagnosed with clinical depression at some point in their um, journey. And touch wood, I haven't had that um, my experience. So I'm, I, touch wood, I'm an outsider. But I feel that's one of the last stigmas to overcome. I think mm. that's still behind the curve. And the more people like you and Stephen Fry and whoever else speak up, the better, because there's still st so much stigma attached to your, your conditions. Uh, there's lots of them. Thank you. Mark, there is uh, Ayabola. I think she wants to. So someone has put up their hand. Hi, Bola. Hi. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, a little bit of background um, to myself. I am an entrepreneur and I do work with um, 
mainly women, young people, and business executives. I have a, I come from a legal background before I went into um, mental health um, studies, and I qualified both as a coach and as a psychodynamic counselor. There is a huge invisible um, disability around DVSV, and that is domestic violence and sexual violence. And this is by no means limited to just women, it could be a man. And almost invariably, um, children born into an abusive relationship will most of the time enter into abusive relationships because they have known no other way of life. And this becomes a spiral thing. Uh, with my work as, um, as a psychodynamic counselor and as a mentor and a coach, I've worked with many women and I'm just going to, uh, with your permission, I'll just go back into my diary and make the life of a young woman of about the age of 31. I'm not going to mention her name for confidentiality reasons, but I'm going to go through what her life has been. She came from the background of an abusive um, family and then she thought she was escaping from this abusive situation. And she ended up with another abusive man who organized gang rape. And so from the gang rape, she had a child and that child was obviously had to be taken from her because by now she was down with um, over reactive sensitivity, difficulty trusting, um, finding relationships and friendships difficult, jumping in and out of relations, relationships, mental health challenges, anxiety disorder, and borderline bipolar. And when you see this young woman, you will not suspect she has anything wrong. She has a second class upper degree in English, but she's never been able to work with this qualification. She actually came to me uh, from the um, psychiatric bed in the NHS. And when she got to me, she was so bad. She did not even have an inkling into who she was. And so the uh, working with her required a lot of understanding, a lot of sensitivity, and to be honest, quite a lot of what I've been hearing this afternoon and I've been so inspired by everything I've heard. So someone like her, and I know there are many women, many men like that who walk around and they will greet you normally and they will, they, they will look everything okay, but they have this baggage behind them, either growing ahead of them or coming behind them, fearing that someone is coming behind them going to do something. And yet, to my horror, and um, I'm not proud to say this because of my legal background, I've seen many of these sufferers, invisible disability victims end up in prisons because nobody has taken the pains to understand what is at the real bottom of what they're suffering from or what the challenges are. And so this was one thing that really um, got my attention and I started working with people with such invisible disabilities. So right now I have quite um, some, I have a few that I've supported and they have their normal lives back. And as an employer, I've actually gone on to employ one person who, who had a serious mental health challenge from, from this background. And I'm happy to report that with a lot of support, pastoral support around her, with a lot of understanding, with a lot of um, walking around her situation, flowing with whatever is happening around her, for her, inside her, she's thriving. Um, I, I run, uh, we run a radio station and we are the very first specialist radio station all over the world, health broadcasting service. And she, we've, we've given her employment and she, she's thriving. She will research a topic, she would script write, she will 
go behind the microphone without any assistance whatsoever, and she will deliver a brilliant broadcast. And that was a powerful tool that we, we actually used to help her gain her confidence back. And so what, what, what I'm trying to say here is, there's a lot more that you and I and everybody around can do to support um, people with invisible disabilities. It's actually better for us to assume that you, you and I can never be the best um, expert on someone else's life. It's better to assume that everybody has something that is challenging to them until proven otherwise. And so um, I, I hope I've, I've been able to say something that can sort of yeah. help us to, to, to move forward from where our very lovely and lofty speakers have, have led us. I'm very happy to have been part of this conference. And I say congratulations to everybody who has been a speaker on this segment. Thank you very Thank much. You. That, that was um, that was quite powerful. Yes, it, it, it's tough, isn't it? Invisible disabilities, um, they're invisible. <laughs> uh, and unless someone speaks up um, uh, and asks for help, um, you don't know. But yes, um, never make assumptions about anybody in any walk of life. We've all had our different challenges in all lives and it's not a competition, as I stressed before. Um, on the, on the, just, um, gosh, you made so many points there, I can't cover them off, but from my retail background, um, you should follow, um, uh, gosh, I can't remember the, um, the Twitter feed, but the CEO of Timpsons, the, um, the shoe, the, the shoe and repair and key maker guy, he makes a point of employing, um, ex-offenders. Mm -hmm. so, um, he rehabilitates hundreds of ex-offenders and his retention rate and his um, his kudos. Um, so retention rate, it's, it's a great number. Kudos is uh, unmeasurable un uh, just for doing the right thing and seeing through um, through, um, you know, you what has been in prison amazing stuff so um plug for him plug for sorry i can't remember he's something something shoey or something fo footy on his um twitter feed but amazing chap um sometimes a bit preachy but frankly he deserves to be thank you very much uh, alex shani uh any last thoughts before we sign off for the day just love one another Yay. Just, yeah. just from two meters. Yeah, just from two <laughs> yeah. meters for now. If you don't I wear a mask if you're in front of me, if you don't mind. Yeah, and tell us if you're vaccinated or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. um, Alex and Shani, uh, please come on my podcast, Disability at the Table. I'd love to cover every every flavour. Yeah. I, Thank I, you. I pay I pay in cake. Oh, my favourite current. Yeah, the best way. Yeah. <laughs> the best way, brilliant. Uh, any last questions? Otherwise, we'll sign off. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that wonderful keynote speech and uh, hosting the panel. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Shani, very much for inspiring us today with the conversations and sharing your stories. There was so much learning, and I think in the comment section, there's been a lot of really good feedback. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you to... Apco, our speaker, our sponsors. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.